All right, Chelsea fans, welcome back to another episode. That's right, of the London is Blue podcast. Dan, one of your hosts here, along with Nick. No, Brandon, still moving house, this crazy thing that he's doing in the adult side of his life. But that can't stop us from coming to talk about what's going on in the wild, wide and wild world of Chelsea at the moment. Cole Palmer announcement, deadline day eve and day thoughts, the League Cup lessons that we've learned. Nick, there's so much to talk about. And I think, again... When we get into the international break that starts next week, it's going to feel quiet. It's going to feel too quiet. Yeah, I, I'm I'm with you on that. I think it's going to feel very, very quiet. And I think that's going to be a good thing. You know, uh, overall, we've we've gone through a marathon summer. So much has happened. I, I have been waiting for the end of the transfer window since about June 30th myself. Um, and I think it's fair to say that I've been the least engaged in the transfer bullshit of anyone. Uh, but it just, it becomes exhausting after a while, especially when you go through a full squad turnover, you know, it, it, when you're near the end and, and I think Potch is able to have a stable squad of players, that's when the real coaching begins. Right. And I think you could look at a result like tonight, we'll talk about in the second half of the show is maybe, not the most comprehensive or cohesive football that we've ever played, but I think everything's just fever pitch right now. And I can't blame anyone uh, who's maybe on the bubble to stay at Chelsea or who's coming into Chelsea for being a little bit distracted. Yeah. I feel like right now your reaction to the transfer window is the, it's been 84 years meme. <laughs> Basically. Yeah. I actually shaved a mustache and just to make sure that I'm ending it in style. So if you're on the YouTube, just, uh, Look at this bad boy. It's, it's, it's nice. It's real well, again, nice. Again, we have plenty of stuff to talk about. What's going on with Cole Palmer coming from City to Chelsea, swapping blues to get to the right shade of color. And you had wonderful deadline day eve, deadline day thoughts that we're going to get into, and then also talking about Chelsea's win and advancing in the Carabao Cup. But before we do that, we just want to say thank you to everybody supporting the show. Five-star reviews, awesome, on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. We are getting very, very close to ending the month at a total of 400,000 downloads, which is really, really exciting. We appreciate everybody who's supporting us on patreon.com forward slash Lenny Blue Pod. Got an amazing Discord community that's going crazy. I think they were trying to figure out how to tell stories about what was happening in the game today when we couldn't watch it. And then on YouTube, as Nick mentioned, we're getting very, very close to 30,000 subscribers. So go subscribe there. It's free. It doesn't cost you anything to do it. And you can hit the little bell icon to get notified and you know, maybe share with a friend, maybe comment on a video, maybe like it, give it a thumbs up. But we appreciate all that. But Nick, it was early this morning that Chelsea got linked to Cole Palmer and it was before the game kicked off <laughs> where we got the here we go from Fabrizio, that Cole Palmer was in fact coming to Chelsea. And Chelsea had identified the player that everyone had been hearing about this, the big name, the deal that was going to shock everybody at the end of the window. Cole Palmer, was that the name you had? No, mine was Kylian Mbappe, Dan. And unfortunately, mine did not come true. Um, no, I... I I, we were talking with with our with our our WhatsApp group, and everyone's kind of throwing around different names. And I know that uh, there's a bunch of of love from Musiala. There was a bunch of questions about whether someone like Ansu Fati from Barcelona would be in the mix. Like there, a th like if you were an attacking player who could either play a number ten or a winger, you were linked to Chelsea. Even resuming the Rafinha to Chelsea blurbs, it just it was out of control, so I kind of <laughs> kind of stayed out of it for the most part. But uh, you know, I think what's hilarious about a day like today is Brandon gets up super early in the morning, does the chat with Naz to try and get the latest and greatest scoop, and like three hours after they're done with the pod, and Naz is like, "I don't know, this seems like it could happen." It happens, and we're talking about it at the very end of the day. Uh, it's, I mean, these days are crazy, man. It is absolutely insane the breakneck speed at which things can happen if Chelsea just pay any sort of like nominal fee for a player. Like Chelsea can move extraordinarily quickly with almost every other club in Europe except for Brighton. So it's it's a pretty fascinating bit of business. Well, it is nice to do business with a club that wants to move quickly as well. They had their own business to take care of as well. So Chelsea end up getting a 40 million pound deal plus 5 million in add-ons. So 45 million total potentially. Or a Kovacic plus 15 million pounds to get Cole Palmer going 
to London from Manchester. We're expecting that the medical is going to happen tomorrow or today when you're listening, Thursday, August 31st, to get the deal done before the window transpires. No risk, I hope not, of a docu-sign or medical error. But maybe, Nick, the real question is just how are you feeling about this in terms of a signing as a deal. I think there was a lot of question around, is he the right fit? Is he the right type of player? You know, he is not necessarily Premier League experienced. I think the way I heard people framing it was Premier League ready was the way that people were billing it because of his experience, like in the PL2, the goal contributions he has had there. I mean, you look at his career in the PL2, 26 total matches, 24 starts, over 2,000 minutes played, 21 goals, 10 assists, 31 total goals and assists contribution. That's a really strong performance at the PL2 level. And, you know, you would argue that some of the teams in the PL2 do progress some really good talent. It feels like maybe it's an overpay, but if this is the player that Pochettino and the staff and, you know, Joe Shields in particular identified as being the right type of fit for what Chelsea are looking to do, I mean, I think at this point, you just kind of, kind of, trust and hope that that is that he is the solution to the problem yeah i mean if if you're if you're asking me if i would have preferred someone more experienced I, the answer is yes and this is nothing against this player like i'm i'm going to root as hard as possible for cole palmer to come in and have a real impact um because we need it we need goals in the team um my my reason for saying Premier League proven the other day when we were talking about this for our transfer update that went out on Monday, which seems about three and a half years ago uh, in, in normal transfer time that we're going through, is I just think this team is super young, um, right? We, we've essentially assembled the priciest uh, under 23 squad in Europe, um, which is super exciting, right? When you think about the future prospects of all of those kinds of characters those 21 year olds coming into their prime at the same time like it's not hard to project how great that could be but i also think in between now and three years from now you're going to need some experience in the team and the only player within that under 23 group who's won anything um at major trophy wise not any sort of like youth trophy is enzo and that was the world cup um and so it's, I think Cole Palmer did win a Super Cup just recently. Sure. Yep. And and look, we we counted it, so you know, let's let's give him his due. Um, but I, you know, I I just I was hoping for someone a little bit more experienced. I was, you know, that was kind of my aim. But you know, I think it's been a big week for Joe Shields at Chelsea. Big couple of weeks between getting Lavi across the line and of course Cole Palmer. Now uh, he's really kind of asserted himself here at the end of the window. Um, he, this is clearly a player that he has a strong relationship with. I mean, the photos of him and, uh, Foden, uh, and, and Palmer at the city training ground where he used to work are, are great. And, you know, I'm sure that Cole Palmer is excited to have, you know, a guy at Chelsea that he knows too, that will make that transition a little bit more comfortable as well. Um, I think your point of, we don't really know much about this guy um, in terms of, of Premier League quality is is the right point to make. There's clearly a dynamic player here, right? The highlight reels will tell you that the fact that he played on City's left wing, I just don't know how, how much you can glean from that. Their, their team is such a machine, right? That taking any player out of City is, is tough to gauge what they're going to do in a non Pep Guardiola coach side. So I just, if you're like, Hey man, he's a starter on day one. I just, I don't know. I don't know if that's true or not. So a couple of things I'll say, and just doing some light work this afternoon, trying to understand a little bit more about him as a player. I think things I liked about the highlight reels that I saw, the way he uses uh, his arm and upper body to kind of palm into people to keep them off, does a good job kind of establishing mm -hmm. distance from people that he's going up against. There's an unfortunate 
highlight of him bypassing Azpilicueta previously that uh, you know, he, he does a good job kind of shoulders over continuing to press. I mean, really good ability to stop and go and accelerate. I think those are some things that, you know, you'd be very excited about in terms of, you know, having an attack that, you know, is able to move quickly and to confuse defenders and to interchange well, particularly seeing the rise of Enzo and what Nico Jackson's doing. And then, just the way he's able to take a shot outside the box or from the very edge of the box, you know, really, really good. I think footwork and then also kind of follow through on his shot. So just some, the technicals are very, very strong that I think gives Pochettino something to work with. I will say I do have a good friend, John, and he was texting me. He actually is in central time. I'm in Pacific time. He was texting me and dropped the messages about, Hey, like this is happening in the morning with the city extra account on Twitter. And I was like, Oh yeah. Okay. Well, what are you thinking? He's like, Oh, it's a horrible deal. If we go ahead with it, superstar in the making. I also don't feel like he's really guaranteed to play more. So it's weird move for me on this end. And then I mentioned that, you know, his shots look good. He said he glides super tall. And also I would not be surprised if he came, became a striker someday. Uh, I guess that's why Havertz has been played up there before. So I thought that was an interesting thought, but it generally said, I think we'll regret it. Hopefully he plays. I want to see how he develops and give him the chance to be a regular. So uh, in general, like the city fans, you know, I did see some people saying like, Oh, some city fans don't care. They're just happy. They sold someone for a ton of money and they were able to, you know, bring in another player to reinforce their side, you know, in terms of, um, uh, uh, Nunez, uh, that yeah, was Mateo Nunez from, uh, yes, from Mateus Wolves. Nunez. Yes. Yes. Yep. We'll clar- clarify. Not, 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 not the Liverpool Nunez. So I did, I think they were also kind of saying like, well, you know, it's great to kind of basically, you know, change one for the other in an area or a position that we need. But there were plenty of people when I went to the Manchester city subreddit, looking at just what they were saying, where people were saying gutted for hearing this news, hope this was his breakout season, super conflicted. Cause I don't want to do, I don't want Chelsea to do well, but I want him to do well, like finally putting it together. And now he gets taken away. So to me, that always speaks volumes because I think we, you know, those t- you know individuals or supporters tend to be a little bit more thoughtful about the evaluation of the player. Maybe have watched them grow up through those like PL two matches in a way that we wouldn't have. So yeah, I think in general, I don't know. I'm excited about the possibility. I'm jury still out on, on a lot of things. I don't necessarily know if this is the game changing player signing to push us forward through the first you know, half of the season, because obviously the January window will be there and <laughs> Chelsea might go back for more players because why not? Yeah. I mean, I, I would say that that's a fair comparison, right? If you were, if you were one of the people out there that was, uh, you know, hearing that Chelsea were going to go bananas in the transfer window and that we were going to go sign someone absolutely outrageous and really make a splash at the end. And then this is the name that comes through. I could understand why there's a lot of skepticism about that. Um, you know, I'm not fully on that side of the aisle, by the way, I think I, I'm just kind of curious as to where he fits, how he fits right in the, in the team, which I think is completely fair uh, place to be. Um, but I think overall, you know, this is clearly a player that has a profile that the club likes, right? I mean, this is for me something that, you know, the club are, are not, you know, that they, they have a plan, whether we totally understand that plan or not, I, you know, is, is, uh, I think will kind of be born out of, of the results that happen with it. Right. But, um, you know, it's clear that he's an exciting player. I don't think you pay that much money for a player who doesn't have a massive upside. It's just whether or not this team that is full of right wingers with a strong left foot uh, can uh, can put some sort of formation together that, you know, gets everything that we want out of out of the team. Right. And I think Phil Chelsea youth had a really great uh, and kind of funny chart of all the kind of right winger left footed signings that kind of came through. Um, You know, Cole obviously played off the left at city. And it's also curious to me, Dan, if he does play off the left at Chelsea, which, you know, just given our injury concerns and the fact that Mudrick hasn't necessarily kicked on yet, if that is, if that's a kind of an indictment of where Mudrick is too right now. 
Could be. I think there's going to be a lot of lessons to learn about what Palmer brings to the side. I, you know, you don't necessarily think that he would start, maybe nor even feature in the first match that he would be available for, which would be the Nottingham Forest match this coming weekend. So it's going to be until after the break that we would get an opportunity to see him. And that would be when you understand like, Hey, where's the pecking order for this side based upon who's healthy, who's in good shape, who comes back match ready from their international duties to support Pochettino and Chelsea and driving this next part of the season forward. So I think, you know, we'd love to hear your thoughts. Leave a comment on the YouTube video, tweet at us, hit us up on Instagram. Let us know what you're thinking about the Palmer deal, but we're going to take a first ad break. And when we get back, we are going to talk about what's happening on deadline day from the past on deadline eve. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. All right, Nick, it's a little bit of a difficult time travel situation here. I want to say that we are not actually breaking. From the future, future, future. (laughs) We're not causing any paradoxes by what we're discussing here. But we wanted to get into the movement we potentially expect, the things around the players who are going to stay players that are going to move and players where we just don't have an understanding about where they sit yet. And I think the one group that we should talk about first is people that we think may make the move tomorrow with some of the connections that they have. I think first one would be someone like Trevor Chalba. You know, Naz Brandon did talk about it earlier that he does have strong considerations for Bayern Munich. Bayern Munich definitely don't want, I think to pay outright was the way that the reporting has come down, but may be forced to if they want the player because of our international loan situations causing Chelsea some headaches in terms of moving on players that we actually do want to loan and uh, maybe not being able to move players that we just want to sell. Yeah, it's interesting. I think we have 35 players listed in the squad right now. Um, If my math is right, we have five goalkeepers. That would be six, so that's 11, 14, 17, 18. I know counting is really great radio. Uh, 21, 24, 25, 28, 31, 34, 35. So we have 35 players currently listed on the Premier League website as in the squad. We know that by simple maths that Poch wants somewhere between 23 and 25, which would be much less than we had in the squad last year, which I think is is really the key, the key point, right? Um, by that math, there's going to be a lot of you know younger players that get loaned out um, that that may not be sold. But uh, Trev, a player that I love, right? I I've made no bones about this. I don't um, I don't understand why this is happening. But of course, Tuchel is at Bayern Munich. There are links to him going to Bayern Munich. You know, I I expect that the fee would be relatively decent for a player with Premier League experience and at his age uh, as well. Uh, I think he would feast in the Bundesliga uh, where they do not defend worth anything. Um, I think he would be a rock. Uh, Of course, uh, Tuchel knows him well and could even play him in midfield if he's having uh, squabbles with Kimmich (laughs) as well. So um, this is one that I think would makes sense from a from like just an outs perspective but will break my heart if it happens because i really do love trev yeah it's gonna be sad if it does end end up coming to that point where he leaves and it is a permanent move particularly you know you just like the guy it's a great story the goal he scored the first goal he scored for chelsea absolutely incredible scenes when it happened we would absolutely have to say a very fond farewell to trev child about that were to happen there are other players though who are maybe closer to a move and the move feels more concrete someone like calum hudson adoy who's been linked to nottingham forest for a pretty low fee relative to where he was being lauded at when Bayern munich were coming in for him in the hey maybe it's a 20 million pound fee maybe it's a 30 million pound fee now moving to nottingham forest who have some squad building challenges of their own a lot of squad bill uh, bloat that they're trying to compete with and he is someone who might join their attack for around the five to eight million pound range i think chelsea also looking just to get some relief from a, a, a expensive contract as well so not just him though nick because Malang Sar is also connected to Nottingham Forest as well at this point. Yeah, this this is funny. Um, I think Sar was also connected to somewhere else, right? 
Um, wasn't he connected somewhere in Italy or France? Well, they, there was a, a desire for a loan for him, but because we can't do more loans, we yeah. are only looking at the permanent options. Roma, we're interested in him. Roma, you're right, you're right. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, that, that was all <laughs> connected to another player that we finally got out of the club. Um, yeah, so Mlongsar, again, um, his wages will be the problem, right? There are probably a handful of teams who would ever take that gamble on a relatively unproven talent, um, at a hundred thousand a week. Right. So it, that's going to be an issue. He's probably going to have to take a wage cut, um, and renegotiate his wages. That's a him problem if he wants to play. Um, but, uh, but unfortunately, yeah, I think there's just no room for, for him in the squad. When you have Batty Shield, you have Cole will, you have the other five center backs that we currently employ. Yeah, two players that are going to come right off the board now that Petrovic did make the bench. Apparently, the work visa issues were not a problem in this most recent match, even though we were told that that may be the issue. And also, we found out that another Premier League squad has a player with a 99 jersey. So, like, what the hell, Premier League? Like, let the man have his number 99. Come on. Come the on. Aspie, we, don't, we don't need the ASP number being recycled just yet. Like, let's let's, let's let ha, come you know, on. Petrovic have have his 99 because it's just going to be fun for you know the pub trivia killing me bergstrom and beach who have been with the first team squad throughout the preseason they would now be likely to be loaned in some capacity and then the last one that probably feels the closest to being done though i don't know why you risked playing him if this was the case was mark kukurea who's getting closer and closer to a loan to manchester united to be the solution to their left back crisis with luke shaw being out for an extended period of time due to injury yeah this makes a lot of sense this is something that i think he'll get a play we won't have to worry about it for a year and then you know i think probably look to move him on you don't move players on loan that you want to keep in your squad for an extended period of time. Otherwise they'd be with you. Right. So it's a pretty clear indicator that you said this the other day that Poch has made his pecking order pretty damn clear at this point. And uh, if it means that Matson stays uh, as, as left back deputy and as left wing reinforcements, fantastic. Um, this is, this is one of the better outcomes of the transfer window. And there was, you know, everyone's saying Chelsea have 211 some million pounds on loan. This that's not where you want to be. Like, let's make no bones about it. But the fact that the club have been creative enough to figure out some of this stuff instead of just having an unhappy camp around uh, Cobham and in Dan's own words, fucking with the aura. Um, that is a really good thing. You know, I think they're, you know have been a lot of people who have shit on the owners, shit on the sporting directors. We have given our fair criticisms this year. Make no bones about that either. But the fact that you're able to creatively solution things, this is, I think, the ownership admitting that we we probably made a hasty choice with Kukurea and finding the right home for him. And again, this is, this is three managers ago. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Yeah, you're right. Uh, in, in terms of just how much learning this ownership group and this sporting director group, now that it's assembled and been disassembled and configured back together because of the, some of the change over there as well, getting into a rhythm and understanding what this team needs, how they can appropriately outfit Pochettino and the squad to achieve at the maximum of their potential this season. So you're right. Like the it's not ideal to have and be wasting so many loans on players that Chelsea do want to move on, but there's just not a market for it now. And that does stunt some growth or create some weird challenges for players who've just come in that we were expecting to go on loan. Uh, someone like Leslie Ugo who mm -hmm. most likely is going to stay and be kind of a midfield closer or rotational player within the, the midfield this season. So as we kind of start talking about those who are likely to stay this is a what feels like a one year problem, a one year bridge with a lot of these loan deals to get us to a situation where Chelsea can actually then move them. We saw Matt Law reporting that the change in Lukaku's contract involved a 37 million pound release clause for him at the end of next season if he does come back to Chelsea. So there may be an opportunity for Roma. Uh, to you know, move on him, or to, for Lazio to just be the next team that picks him up in Syria. <laughs> and just really to keep go on to the other rival. The just, all, just it's always rivals. Uh, yeah, just why be not? Amazing. Uh, Look, 
you want to go for an ultimate villain arc, uh, there's a way. There's a way. Uh, but I, I, you know, Nick, as we talk about players who are going to stay, I think there are a, a bunch of other names here. I'll let you take your pick of the list because there are a few players that I know you are happy that we are getting close to under 24 hours now remaining, and they look likely to be a part of this squad and not departing. Yeah, and, and I think we have to start off with Connor Gallagher. Um, I think a player that we have pushed to stay that – it felt dirty for him to potentially be linked to Spurs when he's been a lifelong him and his family have been lifelong Chelsea fans and he is he's now captained the you know admittedly a very young squad today out to uh to a win in the Carabao Cup and uh look man you need guys like this in the team like i i i don't know if he's going to start every game with the 10,000 midfielders that we've bought in the last 3 weeks but you need guys who bleed Chelsea to be at Chelsea. And there is no better example of that than Connor Gallagher and Reese James, these types. Right. And so I am so pleased for him to stay and to not only stay, but I think he's played pretty damn well this season in a role that we wouldn't have thought would have necessarily been where we see a lot of success. I think he struggled a little bit there in the preseason has really come around. And, uh, you know, I, again, has to stay, fuck West Ham, fuck Tottenham, has to stay. I don't care if the money's good. You need character guys in your squad. When you look at the per 90s that Declan Rice has picked up and Connor Gallagher have picked up, it's almost like the office meme where corporate wants you to tell the difference between these two photos because <laughs> they are eerily similar. And I yeah. would tell you, even if the plan is to sell Connor Gallagher in a year, he is going to be worth upwards of double what he might command in this market today with one season under Pochettino. And if Chelsea get back to where they need to be next season and can go deep in the Champions League and go deep in all these cup runs, that's another 10 to 12 to 15 or 17 matches that Chelsea will play over the number that they play this season. So that's another 1,200 to 1,500 minutes that is going to need to be absorbed. And wouldn't you rather have someone like Connor Gallagher be able to absorb some of those minutes and be rotational with the players that we have in our midfield so that Enzo Fernandez isn't getting worn down, that Moises Caicedo isn't getting run down, that we can really keep this squad healthy and functioning in a way that we haven't been able to before. So again, it's, it's going to come down to the player being comfortable with it and being happy with the situation too. But to me, he's played himself into a role to earn this spot. And I think another player like that is Ian Motson. Ian Motson yes. playing as a 10 today who, with Kukure on the way out, every signal is that not only is Ian Motson going to stay, but the contract that he's negotiating is going to be very likely to be, you know, just have maybe a formality then because if he sees the commitment that the club is making to take a record signing at left back and ship him off to Man United for a season, that's a pretty great endorsement for what they think about Ian Motson and Ian Motson's future at Chelsea. hundred percent. Um, you know, let's, let's hope that this is the plan. Um, there's also been rumors of him going back to Burnley. That can't happen. If Kukurea goes to United, like then you you have no left backs. <laughs> you go from having four left backs to one. Uh, that doesn't make any sense. So yeah, I totally agree with you. And obviously his positional flexibility is everything. Uh, the fact that he can play everywhere on the pitch, uh, is fantastic. And uh, yeah, we just hope that we get to see him more at left back in the future. And the last one of that group where it feels like they might be more likely to stay, and this just feels like a knock on effect of if Trev leaves that Bashir Humphreys, who had an opportunity to mm. contribute in this most recent match, may be more likely to stay given the fact that you still have Fafana out on injury. You've had some individual issues of fitness. I mean, we saw that Levi got injured a little bit. We'll talk about that more, but seems okay. Just the insurance blanket at a center back position and the way that he was able to integrate in the preseason feels like he might have earned an opportunity after impressing Pochettino. Yeah, we'll see about this one. I, I It's 50-50 to me um, because, you know, assuming that Batty Shield doesn't have a setback and that, you know, uh, Levi's ankle is okay. Like then you have four healthy center backs between Desasi, Silva, Batty Shield, and Colwell. That's probably enough to get you through one game a week, um, and and thus 
Bashir going out on a really good loan uh, domestically would make a lot of sense. Um, but it could be that they keep him around for the fall and then send him out on, in January too. I mean, that's happened for for young players at Chelsea before as well. Um, so we'll see. Um, I'm very interested in this one um, because, you know, he had a great preseason. I think that was a name that none of us had on our radar in terms of a, a really great, you know, kind of backup option. Um and, you know, we, we watched him play four games in, in two weeks, and he was very impressive. Uh, I don't think he made a single error that led to a goal during that time. I, of course, some of the distribution was a little nervy, you know, it, but, you know, he's a young cat who's stepping up to a, to a big-time level, so you kind of expect that. Uh, and then the last two, which I just bucketed in the who knows category, because I've got no idea personally what's going to happen with these players. But David Washington, just due to the fact that we thought he was going to be Santos to Strasbourg by way of Sanford Bridge. And that seems unlikely, given the fact that Lukaku, Ziyech and others have taken up some of our international loan spots. And the Mason Burstow with Borja not necessarily ready with Pochettino having a single striker at the moment in Nico Jackson does Bursto stay for at least the first half of the season? It feels like both of them could stay, Nick, but I also think that maybe there's a interesting loan out there. Somebody wants a, a little bit of Washington, a little bit of uh, the Presidente in their lives. Maybe. Um, I would like to see both of them go on loan, personally. I think that uh, Bursto doesn't seem quite at the level as some of the other youngsters in terms of his ability to compete at the very, very highest level. Now that's not an indictment on him. I just think it's experience required. Being a striker is incredibly difficult, right? And he is a physical type of striker who I think would benefit um, with a more combative league, like the championship potentially uh, and kind of cutting his teeth a little bit. Um, Washington, such an unknown quantity, even after the the great podcast that you guys, uh, that you, Jess, and Nath did uh, a couple of weeks ago, he's such an unknown quantity, even at Santos, right? Um, that I think him making that leap to Chelsea seems a little premature, maybe. And sure. if there if there is a loan spot out there, you know, in, in Europe, I, have we used all of our loan spots? Have we used all seven now? Fuck. Yeah. yeah so, so potentially, you know, you'd have to go domestic with him and you'd have to find a really good solution. Otherwise, you'd probably keep him and just nurture him along for something that, that could happen next year. Um, it, it's a tough spot to be in. And he, they clearly bought him as like a futures stock, right? Like, see what happens with this young guy. But yeah, it's, you know, your, your point earlier is like we... The creative solutions mean that we have less choices now. And so we have to be realistic about that. Any name that we didn't or I didn't put on this list that you would want to touch on? Uh, yeah, Marrera is not ready for a Premier League season. So I would anticipate a domestic loan for Marrera. Um, or probably PL2. Maybe. For the season. Yeah, it could be developmental for him as well. Um, I would expect uh, that Samuel Smith, uh, who made the squad today, would would kind of stay in that level or potentially go out on loan as well uh, domestically. And then uh, I think that is that gets us down to 25 players. If I'm my math does the, the math. Exactly what the gaffer ordered, Nick. It's almost as if, Dan, we've done it. We've done it. We, we did it. Everyone just round of applause. Oh. We'll see if that's the case come tomorrow and if the projections hold. But we're going to take our last ad break before giving you some of our thoughts on the highlight reel that we were able to watch and all the notifications we took in during the uh, <laughs> unbroadcasted Chelsea versus Wimbledon match. So stay tuned and we'll be right back for that. All right, Nick, uh, do you want to let the people, before we start talking about the, the match that maybe happened, maybe didn't happen, maybe it was a figment of our imagination, maybe it was just a construct of the Matrix? We don't know because we weren't there. People nope. say they were there, but were they really there? We don't know. Anything that you want to plug about what we've been doing over the past couple of weeks or what we're about to do over the next couple of weeks? Yeah, guys, obviously it's been a fantastic uh, August window for us. We are so, so close to breaking that 400,000 download mark, which is outrageous. My hope is 
by the time that you listen to our Monday pod that we will have good news to report on the entire progress of that. Um, but we have put out uh, two podcasts uh, on Wednesday, uh, one today. You're also going to hear on Friday, uh, Blue Royalty back in the main feed for a reintroduction to Chelsea for some uh, new uh, Chelsea women's fans who will be coming through after the World Cup who are big Sam Kerr fans or Millie Bright fans. So stay tuned to that. And if you haven't gotten to Chelsea women and you're like, hey, now's as good a time as any. The season's about to start. I need to get my game right. Jesse Abdullah and the rest of the crew are going to take you through what it means to be a Chelsea women's fan. And they're going to do a fantastic job. I've already seen a little bit of a preview of what that's going to look like. And uh, it's chef's kiss. So you've also done, Dan, you want to plug the CFC Central, we don't play a back three special? <laughs> well, we, we did do a little bit of analysis, Sam and I, before his European expedition. So I do think, unfortunately, we are going to have a little bit of a fill-in for the Cole Palmer special as he is gallivanting across Europe and ma- many different countries, hopefully watching some football during the international break. But look, we went through the first three games, tried to demystify a couple of things, look at some at least indicate leading indicators. I think we determined that we couldn't necessarily call them trends because we don't have enough data points yet. It's not statistically relevant enough. So yeah, go back and listen to that. I think it was really special. And then we've got a ton that we're going to try to do over the course of the international break just to make sure that, you know, you who are going through a Chelsea withdrawal do not suffer during that time. We are thinking about you and making sure that we've got you taken care of. But Nick, we did play a match. It is confirmed we did actually play a match against Wimbledon this past Wednesday, August the 30th, 2023, in the Carabao, a.k.a. League Cup at Stamford Bridge. It was a win for Chelsea, 2-1. to one. And I think there are fist stand highlights, so I'm just going to let Jake drop those in here right now, and then we're going to talk about three points. Yeah, but please, please drop them in, Jake, because God only knows that people are maybe hearing them for the first time. <laughs> All right, so... I came up with three things that I wanted to talk about that were of note to me. Can, can I just quickly, before we start, th- this is point zero uh, of the three things. Okay. Listening to Jason Cundy on the on the broadcast was fucking hilarious. He was trying to coach the team from the press box. Like there were multiple times where he would like go, go now, go early. <laughs> It was like it was such a joy to listen to him and like the passion. You want to talk about a dude who has passion for Chelsea Football Club? Jason Cundy is unbelievably good at radio. It is so funny. Which player do you think over the course of 90 minutes <laughs> Jason Cundy gave the most coaching to? Um perhaps Marrera. Uh that was tough. Yeah. That was a tough look. Uh I think I think he was a little critical of Bashir's distribution as well during the time. Like there was there was a few moments in there, and especially in the first half drought that we went through that were were not great. But he was also very complimentary of many of the younger players as well. That's true. That's true. And we we did you know have a, a few youngsters get an opportunity to contribute in this this match we mentioned it earlier, but I think point number one for me is Connor Gallagher getting to captain the side. Fuck so now yeah. we, we, we keep on migrating captains, right? Reese James and his health isn't healthy. We don't, you know, don't have him. Uh, well, we move down the list, right? We haven't had necessarily an opportunity for, for Chilwell. So Chilwell gets an opportunity to get a little time off. So it moves down, not necessarily to Enzo. Enzo's worn the armband this season, but now it's Connor Gallagher getting the nod. Connor Gallagher getting the opportunity in this league cup match. Really, really cool thing. Super awesome some reward for the contributions that he's had and I think unfairly criticized and judged heading into the season. But I do think, Nick, the tide is turning and more people are starting to see, not in this match because they couldn't view it, but Mm. people are starting to see that Connor has a valuable role to play on this side and really is well-liked by the coaching infrastructure. Yeah, no doubt about it. Um, You know, I... I, too, have only seen the highlights that Chelsea have posted on the website. So if you were at the game and you saw something different, please let us know, obviously. But it was basically the Conor Gallagher show and the Nani Matawake show, right? These were the two players that Cundy was probably most uh, positive about during uh, the entirety of the game. Uh, And look, I don't, you know, we already talked about Conor and what he means to Chelsea, but I think... The fact that in a moment like this, 
Uh, first of all, he's one of the elder statesmen of that group. Um, <laughs> at what, 23? Wild. 23, yeah. maybe? Uh, so that's pretty crazy. But also just the fact that, you know, he got the captain's armband. We've seen sometimes where you get the captain's armband and you kind of try and play outside of yourself. You try and do too much. He didn't do that from what I could tell in the highlights. He really played within himself. He advanced the ball well. He took ownership. He got in the referee's face a couple of times. He did what a captain's supposed to do. And I think that is a fantastic thing. And look, as we as we know from the early 2000s Mourinho sides, you cannot have enough good leaders in a team. There, there is no limit to the amount of good leaders you can have. And so getting that opportunity perhaps develops him as a leader as we move forward too. All right, second point I want to get into. Matawake scores and Enzo scores. Phenomenal. Yes. I know you want to go probably talk about Matawake scoring because you've been excited to talk about him mm -hmm. since he made an appearance in the side after the U21 run and then kind of just didn't get a lot of appearances at the tail end of the season, came back, had to get himself back into the fitness. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to give you the floor to espouse some praise about one Noni Matawake. Best player on the pitch by a mile for me. Um, you know, he, in, in a first half that was admittedly not great, um, he was the one taking responsibility in the attacking third. He won the penalty. He scored the penalty. I think he played even better in the second half until he was taken off. Uh, he was the outlet uh, in a lot of different ways. And the, the one thing that we talked about last year, which, of course, there were limited opportunities to see him play, but was that, yes, he's super tricky. Where is the end product? Like, where is the where is the rest of it going to come in? Where are the assists, where are the goals going to come in? You started to see him kind of turn a corner a little bit there where the play became a little bit more direct and less squiggly lines a little bit. And so I like to see that progress. I think I, I want him to keep the squiggly lines in service of some of the more direct stuff that he can play. And the penalty was stone cold, you know, and, and we, we, we don't have enough good penalty takers of the team either. So it's nice that that could potentially be an option. Well, it was also nice on the flip side when Enzo got his first yes. goal. So that was Matueke's first goal at Stanford Bridge for Chelsea. This was Enzo's first goal in total for Chelsea. It should have been against West Ham with the penalty, but that mm -hmm. didn't take. So the keeper just said, you know what? I'm just going to pass it into the path and Here let hell. him. Yeah, just give an opportunity, right? And I saw someone call it a screamer. I don't think you call it a screamer if it bounces. No, <laughs> but, <laughs> no, it was not. It was a well placed strike. It was you know. very well placed, very well placed strike, very good reward for someone who has absolutely been on a different level in midfield play relative to his peer group in Europe this season. It's a, again, it's a, it's a leading indicator. It's not mm -hmm. a full trend yet because it's not enough minutes, but this is, he looks so good this season. I think Mark Worrell, uh, you know, gate 17 Marco was put the tweet out there. They said it, it was very Lampard esque as he was watching the game with the eight, the way he was running in late, the way he was adding value in the attack. And this is all what we've been looking forward to, right? Is that the infrastructure is going to build up around Enzo to let him be this absolute creative mastermind, you know, the Picasso on the pitch for us. Mm -hmm. And we're getting that. And it's super duper exciting. Yeah, no, he's, he is really taking a leap this year. Um, and again, we're only four matches in, right? So that's, that's saying a lot, but what you're seeing from him, I think is being an on the pitch type of leader and certainly the conduit from which all great things happen at, at Chelsea football club, there, I saw a bunch of people after the the win at the weekend go, we're going to look back on that $105 million that we spent on him and go, boy, we got a bargain, um, which I think says all there, all you need to say. Obviously, him getting off the off the mark with a goal, I think, is massive. You know, I think any time you're able, you know, that's why I was so happy for Nico over the, over the weekend to get his first goal. Anytime you're just able to get that off of your back and, and move forward and it's not... I mean, I think we all remember the Fernando Torres drought that he started with at Chelsea and how we were just dying for him to score a goal and like make it happen. And it just never seemed to want to. And then he got the, the shittiest of all goals and it felt like the weight of the world was lifted off his shoulders. The fact that Enzo and Nico don't have that and that 
some of these other young guys are going to get their opportunities too is massive. And uh, I know that Enzo's not primarily a goal scorer. Like that's not why we bought him, you know, to, to do at Chelsea, but he has it in him. We've seen him score bangers for Argentina. Um, so it's something that I'm super excited about. And my hope is, Dan, this gives him the confidence to let him rip a little bit more often. Well, well look, if he could even get a second or third goal, I think that would, it, you know, it's in the league, right? Like not necessarily in the league cup that would two goals would match his highest ever, um, which was back at river plate. And in that season at Benfica, he had one goal in 17 matches, five total assists. Now, like we're looking for two things, right? We're looking for his assists to skyrocket and we're looking for some goal contribution, not necessarily double digits, but double digit total goals and assists would be very nice. I'm also looking like not only just for assists, I'm looking for his hockey assists too, right? Because to me, if we are able to move the ball fluently, it will be because he is playing well, that he's opening up a long diagonal pass for a Matawake or a Sterling or someone like that to then play it into Nico for the goal. And for me, those are just as valuable from a deeper line midfielder than just the pure assist itself, even though we know he has that in him. So what you're talking about is shot creating actions, yes. which actions which leads to a shot. He had 68 of those when he played his first season at Benfica. He had 59 of those in the totality of last season. So he went from 4.42 per 90 to 3.34. So regression. But we know that this Chelsea side last year really, really struggled. Chelsea side that doesn't even exist anymore because it's been blown up and rebuilt. In He has 19 total in three Premier League matches this season for 6.33, which feels a little unsustainable <laughs> over the course of nah. the season. He's primes the Dan. You know that. Come on. Yeah. I, but you think about the fact that in three games, he has 32% of the shot creating actions he had over an entire, like entire half a season. That is very exciting. Very, very exciting. I mean, j- like the pace is unsustainable, but if it gets anywhere between 75 and 90 shot creating actions, which would be a huge, it'd be like a 20% boost year over year. That means Chelsea are scoring a shit ton of goals. Like, yeah. Means his hack is eating well, and uh, he is the one who is feeding them. So mm-hmm. the last one I want to talk about is that Cole's injury and Pochettino's comments on it. So Simon Johnson did make the comment that Colwell, who came off of the match, went straight down the tunnel to get treatment, came back out in the end. Ollie Glanville had a little bit of commentary saying that he observed him. Ice pack, you know, just bandaged around the leg. Didn't seem to be a major issue. Simon Johnson said that Colwell told him directly, just got a kick, was walking okay as he left the ground. And then Pochettino's comments were, it's not going to be a problem for the weekend. Not an injury, just went to put ice on his legs and down down the tunnel. So like just preventative more than anything else, like not risking anything where we didn't have to in this match. So a little bit of drama, but the drama is thankfully not a consideration. Yeah. And again, it's, this is the sort of smart management that you expect with someone like Pochettino, right? You're already, you already have a bit of an injury crisis at center back. This is one of your highest valued players in the team. He got a kicking because League One teams do that, right? Or League, are they League Two? They're League Two. League Two teams do that. Fuck out of here. We'll, we'll save you for the weekend, right? You've, you've done a job. We'll see you. And again, the fact that we, like, we just got to keep these guys healthy because if we keep them healthy, we're going to be scary uh, when this team eventually gets its, its act together and is playing fluently. You can't do that if everyone's in and out of the injury booth, right? So so the fact that they're just doing this as a preventative measure is music to my ears. You shouldn't need Lee Lycowell to beat uh, Wimbledon. Well, we did not get the most favorable of draws because Chelsea drew Brighton at home in the next round. I will say it's not as unkind. Like, it's not as bad as, like, City's draw, right? It's City and Newcastle in the next round. It's... You know, Liverpool, Leicester, I mean, that that's kind of a nice draw for them. Aston Villa and Everton, right? So another head-to-head a Premier League matchup. And, you know, Arsenal get to face Brentford, another Premier League matchup. So, you know, there are a few teams that avoided, you know, Premier League teams that avoided a Premier League matchup. But 
Uh, Nick, it's just an opportunity to beat Brighton for three times, you know, three times across this season. Hopefully, play your first team, blow them off the park, move on. Like I, when we were down one nil, I was like, boy, my prediction that we're going to win this trophy just went down the shitter. Um, but uh, play your first team, blow them off the fucking park, move on. That is my my hope. Like we don't, we're not in Europe. Right. So that I think that matches in October, late October. Right. Yeah. So everyone just just saddle up for one one tough game week and uh, and move on to the next one. Sure going to be spicy, particularly when Levi Colwell and Moises Caicedo both end up on the <laughs> score sheet and really just say how much they love Brighton, how much they love the Zerbe. Uh, assist is. assist from Sanchez as well. <laughs> Why not? Yeah, just just let it be. Ultimately, really, really good end of it. I did ask for some not so um, not so serious three word match reviews. I said uh, wrong answers only. Janique had one like Kukurea's on fire. There was CS <laughs> who had absolutely outstanding performance. Carefree Tosser with what a view. Kevin with the Palmers are sweaty. Yeah, just a, a couple of fun ones to, but like you know, nobody was able to watch the game. We're reacting off of highlights. We're trying to pick out the best themes possible. Chelsea will watch. Will play a match though this weekend against Nottingham Forest, the last match that Chelsea play before the international break, which will be broadcast, which we will be able to react to in more full context than we have in this one, Nick. But that's it's kind of where we are. We've got. Can, can I a, share a mine? Day left. Can I share yes, my yes, you may share, share yours. Cundy's coaching clinic. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. It's great. Thank you. Uh, for those who who you know would typically have taken time off during their their midday activities in the U.S., it was I, I had incredible oof action out of office action mm -hmm. uh, because there, there actually was none. You just were working instead because there was nothing to actually follow live. So that's going to do it for this episode, though. We thank you so much for your support over what's been an amazing, incredible, and breakneck August as we get into the start of the Pochettino era and Chelsea just continuing to do a ton of business. So uh, leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Go follow us on YouTube. Come join the Patreon community, patreon.com forward slash London Blue Pod. We'd love to have you there, but that's going to wrap it up for this one. So unless something else happens tomorrow, there should not be another emergency pod, but you never know. And Mbappe to Chelsea, baby. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> so until next time, Chelsea fans, you know what to do. Keep the blue flag flying high. <laughs>